Hey guys, what's going on? It's Alexander Williamson here with the secret history living in your aquarium or your five gallon vase, whichever you want to do. So if you guys remember, I have two videos where I build this and then we stock it and we talk about what it's like to build a filterless fish bowl or vase or aquarium. And we also talk about the deep substrate and its impact. In this video, I want to go over how it has cycled and what it's like when it's now found its plateau or it started to become seasoned rather than just cycled. So now I only have to put food in about once a week. I give them some flake food. Uh, I only top off the water about once a week too. Uh, maybe 1 20th or 1 15th of the volume uh, evaporates off. And I want to talk about some really important things like placement and how it has matured and also show you the processes that are going on in the tank uh, as far as dealing with the nitrite cycle, with the plants growing, and how the different creatures need to be selected carefully to balance out your specific tank with the plants you've chosen and where you've chosen to put it. So let's jump right in. Let's test it and make sure that it matches up with a completely cycled and stable six-year-old aquarium with filtration. And uh, I'll see you guys in a minute. All right, everybody. So here is one of my large aquariums, a 50-gallon, uh, with big filtration, FX6, under it. And we're going to put one of these test strips in here just to give a baseline. Now, this tank is super planted and uh, is completely balanced for years. So we want to compare softness of the water and all that and nitrates and nitrates. So we're going to take another swab of these API test strips in the vase and we're going to set that here. Uh, this side being the little vase, the other side being the bigger tank and we're going to take a look at the differences over time you only need to give it a minute or two but in the meantime i just wanted to show you guys how this thing has evolved so we've got the creeping jenny that i told you guys i was going to put in here immersed and it doesn't so much have a, a spot where i rooted it as i just hung it over the edge with the roots in the water and the roots then found places to go and actually anchor themselves because it is a crawling plant. Any hydrocaudal or uh, moneywort, pennywort, any kind of thing like that will do the same thing. And it's just kind of found a spot. Now at the same time, you can see that the Bacopa monieri that's in here and the Bacopa colorata have actually grown out of the water because I've never trimmed this in four months and I've never done any water changes. But at the same time, we can see that the shrimp seem happy. Uh, the other uh, week, I think it was two weeks ago, we were looking at this tank and we noticed that two of the shrimp were fully buried and had uh, a load of eggs on them. So, of course, they're having babies, which is then in turn creating food for the white cloud minnows. And there's five white cloud minnows in here. There's five of what you might call meteor minnows or long fin white cloud minnows. Some people call them Hong Kong white cloud minnows. Um, but they've been eating both the baby shrimp, obviously, and any sort of algae that's in here they'll sometimes pick at. But I only feed this tank about once a week. Now, depending on how you set up your tanks, uh, especially if they're these kind of filterless deep substrate kind, uh, you might need to actually add more food than that. But I've been watching their weight and their activity and they seem just fine, uh, just active and healthy. And uh, the sunlight seems to grow just enough algae that they'll pick at anything filamentous that's floating and they'll nibble on that. And then with the addition of the little scuds we put in here, as well as the uh, freshwater Daphnia, they also eat that algae. Now, this is in a window where it's not really direct sunlight ever. The most direct it gets is right at sunset in the summer, which is now. And that is right between the, the kind of V in this tree here. It sets there. So you only get 
maybe an hour of very oblique sun. It's never completely direct. And that's why I've chosen pretty low light plants for this tank if you go back and look at the build. Same with this little one here where we've got the papyrus growing out of it. But what I wanted to point out was how important it is to have some immersed plants in something that has no mechanical filtration because this is like having your plants on steroids as far as being able to grow and process nitrates, nitrites, and ammonia. So they're able to suck all of those things out of the water while also getting the hydration they need, but then they can get their CO2 and their oxygen uh, out of the air, which allows them to much more efficiently do that than when they're underwater. And then also the sunlight as you can see where the biggest leaves are, they're facing the window. So if this was in direct sunlight, it might grow too much algae, um, but you could play with that. Uh, for me though, I knew I didn't wanna have that problem, and you can see the different size in these leaves. So on this side, they're about yay big, compared to the ones facing the other side, same plant, they're huge and that's just because plants know where to optimize putting the biggest leaves that can do the most photosynthesis. And while they're doing that, again, they don't have to filter it through all the water because every six inches or so of water, you're losing 50% of your UV radiation uh, that that plant needs. All right, let's take a look at these strips. So they're very similar, not a trace of nitrites or nitrates in either tank, which is what I would expect. Also, uh, as far as pH goes, they're pretty darn close. We've got a slightly acidic pH, which is what I wanted. Uh, I tested the TDS uh, on my own several times, and it's balanced out after the first month. Now, we did add some crushed coral granules and uh, shell granules into that layer of sand that's kind of a cap. And when we did that, that adds some minerality as well as some KH and GH buffering. And rather than keep climbing, it has stayed the same because my tap water is essentially RO or, or distilled water. It has almost no total dissolved solid. So when I'm adding tap water as a top off, and what I'll do is I'll wait till it gets to the hip in the vase here, and then I'll fill it back up to about here. So I add, I don't know, 1 20th of the volume back to it every two weeks or so how, as it evaporates. Uh, luckily, this shape and with those plants at the top and the stick at the top, the condensation in the morning and when the sun is on it in the late afternoon and evening, it actually comes back down and, and kind of dribbles down the jar. Which brings me to my next big point, which is that it's important to put these filterless aquariums, uh, you can do one of two things, to either put them in sunlight that changes throughout the day, because that will actually cause convection within the water currents. So you'll actually get the water mixing as temperatures change. And I've seen throughout the day, the temperature changes about 10 degrees here. It's also in a bay window, which this side is much cooler than even this side facing the room, and that helps to keep the water moving. Beyond that, I chose a pretty lively fish species, the uh, white clouds, or meteor minnows, whatever you want to call them, uh, and they will actually stir the water surface tension and break it when they come to the top, and they also eat things like little fruit flies and mites and whatever lands on there. There's always going to be little almost microscopic size critters that come to your aquarium and that populate your aquarium over time. So beyond all that, this area underneath here has the larger stones and because of that the water can go through there and it absorbs the acidity and the pH or, or rather the pH uh, alkaline or acidity of whatever's in this substrate when it's got this much space in between. See all these empty spots? We're not seeing any gas bubbles forming in here though. So we don't have a huge pocket yet of of uh, biological filtration even needing to happen. On this side though, you can see the sunlight and it is causing algae to grow 
And so we know we have aerobic conditions and that means that there's oxygen in there because it's not too packed and the sand didn't act as a total cap. And so we can see a little bit of algae on the glass, a little bit of green. Well, that's putting off CO2 at night and oxygen in the day. So you get these bubbles and every so often they'll come up and they'll percolate up. So that is just part of, you know, a lake does that too. And uh, that's part of what is actually filtering the bad stuff in the tank. So if you see here, we do have a little bit of bad um, hair type algae, if we can get this to focus, um, right here on the bottom. But for the most part, it stayed away. I was going to put a Siamese algae eater in there because it started growing on quite a few surfaces. But over time, it seems like the minnow and the snails and the uh, shrimp actually picked it away enough that I don't have to worry about it. Now the other kind of algae that's always gonna grow when you have sunlight on any water with any sort of nutrients in it is going to be diatomaceous al algae. Now diatomaceous algae uh, is formed by the, uh, the silicone that's actually in the sand, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so you know how we have carbon-based life form and so forth. Uh, well, silicone can be incorporated into uh, biological structures as well, and diatomaceous algae is one of the few that silicates uh, actually help build the structure, and that's why it's so hard. That's why it's rock hard on the side of your aquarium, and you have to chisel it off with a blade. Well, I can't really fit a blade into this funky container, so that's why I put a nearite snail in here and nearite snails have evolved to eat that. So that has taken care of that. And before it even gets into a thick uh, state of algae, basically the snails, like we've got these little ram's horn snails, and then we put a few trumpet snails into the substrate. So they help stir all this up, loosen those gas bubbles, and help the transfer of water so that the water can actually get processed by that beneficial bacteria that's acting just like a mechanical filter, just only at a very slow pace. So this actually does have biological filtration. It's not like it's a true filterless tank in the sense of having nothing going on filtering it. If that were the case, we'd have to change the water every few weeks as the fish dirtied it. But as you can see here, the surface area alone plus the plants are removing as much of the uh, ammonia, which turns into nitrites and nitrates, as we need. We have that cycle going on because we used uh, pre cycled wood here down the center column and see all these roots growing it can get unsightly and that's why sometimes you'll want to pull certain plants out with tweezers and replant or trim and replant but everything uh, including the low light cryptocrine are growing and they don't seem to have any diatomaceous algae on them or you know any algae period so so far, so good. I think we have plenty of cleanup crew with about 10 shrimp originally placed in here. And then we've got the five white clouds uh, and a nearite snail. About two, I think I put two ram's horn snails and three Malaysian trumpet snails in here. So that's what's in here holding all this together. And I just thought it would be important to go over a couple of those things. And here in the early morning, you can see how dark it is in here. And it's plenty light for low light plants, actually. This is just as uh, bright as a lot of lights you would find at, you know, um, in, in a basic kit for plants uh, at a big box store. But by later in the day, it gets much brighter. and. Uh, they actually start photosynthesizing and you'll actually see uh, purling sometimes going on if it's a real sunny day, which is kind of interesting. So uh, beyond that, you can see that the plants start kind of out competing one another like this, uh, this, uh, this little hydrocaudal here uh, has started kind of strangling this uh, Ludwigia arcuata. And uh, Arcuata has lost all its red because it's not an intense light. The super red, Ludwigia, is still red, but everything else that was red is pretty much not anymore because of the low light. 
Now, you can always try moving things to a brighter place, but things can kind of uh, escalate quickly. So keep an eye on your surface area and uh, you know your hardscape. That's why we put these white rocks in, was so we could monitor if there was algae or biofilm or too much fish waste or whatever it may be building up. And we can see that the shrimp are handling any excess fish waste or food and uh, dead plants, things like that, and so are the snails. We've got another snail up there. Yet, we haven't put extra food in weekly, and that has allowed it so that the snails haven't exploded. They haven't gotten that biological signal that it's a free-for-all time. So I just wanted to give you guys some more tips on the filterless aquarium as it's cycling up. Soon it will probably need a bit of a haircut, but for now we're just going to let it do its thing and be natural. The fish still have plenty of room to swim around and do their thing. Uh, they can go all over in here. And it's just so important to pick your species correctly. You need a cleanup crew and you need an active fish that's going to stir up that water and not create too much ammonia. Like a goldfish and a pleco would be poor decisions for filterless tanks generally, especially smaller ones. But these little minnows, little cyprinids, and... Uh, and other fish like that, little pygmy sunfish or uh, battis or bettas, those are all fine. Uh, just make sure that the temperature stays within their comfy range. So I hope this is helpful. If so, please give it a like and uh, subscribe for more follow-ups. We'll continue to follow up on all the tanks that I've built on the channel. And uh, yeah, it's always a good time checking in with you guys and showing you that the, the fish are happy, healthy, and... Uh, having fun i don't know are they having fun you guys decide but i will see you guys next time thank you so much if you hit that like button it sure does help the algorithm and the mystical gods that control youtube and it is much appreciated talk to you guys later bye